थैंक यू वेरी मच मेयंक आई होप आई एम बींग हर्ड am i am i yes sir very clear can, we, okay. yeah, can see you, you. No go ahead sir okay thank you ma'am for your kind words you have said far more than was necessary but thank thank you all the same and anyway, we uh, good morning to all fellow rail enthusiasts rail fans lovers of the iron road fellow ecologists ladies gentlemen it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce the first speaker of not only today's proceedings but the first speaker of the conference itself warren miller is a retired electrical engineer from australia with a passion for the railways and in its history he has been a frequent visitor to india and was the society's first international member he has contributed regularly to the society's quarterly magazine they say that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach keeping that in mind Warren will speak to you about dining on the railways. Since the rhythm of a train's movement makes one hungry, let us hear what Warren has to tell us about food on trains and railway premises. So, welcome, Mr. Warren Miller. The stage is all yours. Oh, thank you, JL. Please carry oh, on. Right. Um, I'll need to share the screen, but firstly, thank you, Vinu, and thank you, Joe at JL. for the invitation to make this presentation at what I think is going to be a really interesting and enjoyable conference. Uh, the subject was dining and railways, which is two things people like or should like, but I won't be making it a very uh, deep historical analysis. It's more a case of looking at the infrastructure that railways have provided uh, in many countries and over many years to uh, assist with passengers to enjoy their trip. So if I can move to the sharing the screen, uh, so if I have the power there, uh, I'll need to I'll need to have screen sharing permitted. Ah, thank you. Ah, right. Well, I've jumped ahead, but uh, oh, wait a second. Very good. Railways and dining. I'll be looking at uh, three different aspects. Basically, uh, I'm afraid I won't be talking about food at any length, but I'll be looking at refreshment rooms, the fixed infrastructure, dining cars, and also the provisions that uh, exist for refreshment on the platforms. So, moving right into it, a good place to start is a, sh a very short look at what happened before railways. There's a lovely picture here of people getting onto a stagecoach, and of course. In Europe, travel by stagecoach preceded the railways. There was a well-established network, but it was a slow and uncomfortable trip. A stagecoach could normally only go about 25, perhaps 30 kilometers, before they had to stop to change the team of horses. They'd normally stop at a, an inn where passengers could have some food, because it uh, took a, a lot longer to change horses than it does to change locomotives. So the railways looked at this as their model when they started carrying passengers in the early uh, 1830s, and the concept was obvious that passengers had to get out of the train and go to a refreshment room in a station or a building to get their food. They did, didn't give a lot of attention to dining on trains. That was not the early opportunity. I've got here a very nice picture, and I hope everyone can see it. This is Swindon railway station in Britain. And the train that's running through it is quite an important one. It's uh, pictured in 1895, and it's the first express train that ran through Swindon without stopping at the station for people to get refreshments. Uh, the reason for this was the railways had made a fairly poor bargain when they built the station. They'd agreed that the builder could build the railway, build the refreshment room at his own cost, and they would give the refreshment room to the builder on a 99-year lease. At a peppercorn rent, which means virtually no rent, the idea being that the builder or another contractor would provide the refreshment service uh, at no cost to the railway. They made one mistake, however. The contract included the provision that every train would stop there for ten minutes for refreshments, and that no other refreshment operator would be allowed on the station. The refreshment room itself was rather attractive. Uh, but it rapidly became apparent to the railway that stopping every train for 10 minutes when many passengers uh, were going to destinations further on by what should have been an express 
was a bit of a handicap in running a railway. Uh, they disputed with the contractor the question of whether they should always be stopping, and the contractor rightly said, well, I have a contract. The contract says you will stop trains. So they went to the courts, and the court upheld the contract, of course, because that provision had been agreed to, and there was no need to set it apart. So the railway was then faced with the cost of buying the contract out, and uh, as they didn't have a lot of money, it took them nearly 50 years until 1895 to do that, and at that stage, it cost them £100,000, which is about £8 million in today's money. So that was an expensive learning experience. Well, that's just a little bit of background, but I'm now going to look at a few refreshment rooms in different locations. This is a refreshment room in Australia. I'm sort of starting closer to home. It's still used as a refreshment room and you can have a meal there, but it's uh, no longer for railway passengers because the station, which is at Junee in the state of New South Wales, no longer has a passenger service. A lot of uh, express trains pass there between Sydney and Melbourne and there's plenty of freight trains, but unfortunately you can't get a train there or arrive there. But the refreshment room has been kept in pretty much its original condition and it's operated by a uh, contractor who makes a nice little business just for local people from the town and people driving through who want to stop there for a, a break. It's very nice to sort of be able to see it in very much the way it was when it was built. The platform is through the doorways at the far end and there used to be a hotel with some retiring rooms upstairs. Uh, Moving on now to something a little more foreign. This is Istanbul. It's Serkeji Station in Istanbul. And the refreshment room is the building you can see on the right with the table and chairs moving it set out onto the platform. It's uh, quite an attractive station and it was decorated in uh, very much a sort of an Eastern style. The interior of the refreshment room is rather nice. You've got stained glass windows, a very decorative roof panelling around the walls and pleasant table settings. So, uh, and that does have a train service, most certainly. A very nice place to have a meal before you depart or when you arrive. Moving to a smaller station now. This is a medium sized station in France. It's at a small town called braille sur roya which is in the southeast near the French Italian border. And the station includes a refreshment room, which I think is a nice model for a small, a small size station where people need to have something to eat. It's very up to date. It's got about 10 tables inside and a couple on the platform. And it provides a pleasant range of meals and uh, light, light food and refreshments. It's rather cheery and bright and a very nice place to go. What's next? Ah, yes. Uh, I'd like to look at some of the people who contributed, and this man uh, really pioneered good railway dining in America. His name is Fred Harvey. He was born in Britain, but at the age of 17, he migrated to America in uh, about 1850. And he worked in the hospitality industry. He opened a restaurant, but it was not successful. He found he couldn't make a living. So he fortunately, he took up employment with the railways. One thing he soon found there was that traveling on the railways, the quality of food you could get was inconsistent and unpredictable, particularly as you went further west. So with his connections and his uh, hospitality background, he came to an arrangement with the Santa Fe Railway that he would run refreshment room, rooms before them, pretty much on a similar arrangement to Swindon in that the railway would provide the premises at no cost and he would invest and operate the business to feed the passengers. And he made a great success of it. He was a very enlightened employer for his time. At the peak, he had 84 refreshment rooms operating through America. And one of his uh, approaches was that he took great care of his staff. To serve in the refreshment rooms, he recruited young women between the ages of 18 and 30. And as an employer, he provided a fair bit of care for them. They were given accommodation at or near the place they worked, and it was supervised by the senior girl there. They had a curfew and uh, male visitors were chaperoned, so he took good care, of the, good care of their well-being. The only condition was that he did not allow the ladies to leave employment to marry before they'd served one year's business. 
And indeed, because they were generally regarded as you know, ladies of good character in the Wild West, most of them did leave his employment eventually to marry. And it's estimated that 5,000 of the so-called Harvey girls uh, went west and married in their new homes. But he was well known for the quality of his food and the consistency of service. And uh, they were the Harvey House restaurants continued to be built and operated until the 1960s. This is a picture of the inside of one. Uh, it's a staged picture, of course. The diners are all there looking a little bit self-conscious for the camera and the waitresses are there ready to serve them what would hopefully be a very enjoyable meal. So Fred Harvey's name is well regarded in America and uh, if Colonel Sanders' name lasts half as long, I'd be very surprised. Now, moving on to the classical stations in Europe. Uh, this is in Budapest. It's Budapest Kaleti Station, Budapest Western Station, built in a very uh, classical style. It also had a restaurant, uh, which is still there in very much the original style. As you can see, it's, it's, it's been maintained well, but the tables and chairs are just standard cafe tables and chairs. There's a Coca-Cola sign there. So it's a functional restaurant, but the setting remains very much uh, evident from the original station architecture. And it's nice to see this because too many of them have been lost. Now, also in Europe, it was quite common for some railways to provide different classes of restaurant for the different classes of passengers. This is not dissimilar to what airlines do these days with the airport lounges, where you have a special business class lounge for a business traveller, you know, and so on. Not all of the railways did it, but this one is in Amsterdam, and it's the entrance to what was the first class restaurant in the station, which is a very nice restaurant. It had both a bar and a restaurant area. Uh, this is the bar you can see there. It's uh, very nicely furnished, not highly patronised today, but still going. And this is the restaurant area. It's got uh, potted plants, uh, panelled walls, uh, a beam ceiling, comfortable seating, and very, very nice too. But it's not, real, not for the first class passengers only anymore. Anyone can dine there. Although I'm afraid the food tends to be pretty much a fast food kind of menu these days, which is a little bit of a pity. Moving to one of the greatest railway refreshment rooms in Europe, and unfortunately this one has long gone, this is in Frankfurt main station, and that is huge. If you look at the ceiling, I'd say it's at least six metres high, and you can see one room leads through to another. There's large chandeliers, columns. It was a fabulous railway refreshment room, and it had many visitors, many very famous visitors. And in fact, on the 5th of December 1901, it had a very famous visitor, the Orient Express. In fact, on this occasion, the train was approaching the terminus fairly fast and had a brakes failure. And of course, in Europe, where the platforms and the rails are at the same level, it simply ran through the buffers across the concourse and bashed into the restaurant, doing a fair bit of damage. Uh, happily, there were no serious injuries, but it certainly interrupted the meal that evening. It's quite an impressive photograph. Uh, this will look familiar. It's the booking office at St Pancras Station in London, taken about oh, 25 years ago. Uh, if it looks familiar, the architecture is very similar to the booking office at Mumbai CST Station, which is both in a very strong Gothic style. But when this was taken, passengers still had to go there to buy tickets. Uh, nowadays, nobody buys paper tickets. It's uh, all internet bookings and either downloadable or printable tickets. So what do you do with a nice old Gothic booking office that no longer is needed for selling tickets? When the station was renovated, of course, this was converted to a restaurant and bar uh, as part of the renovation to service the Eurostar trains through the Channel Tunnel. And if you look at this picture and the next one, you'll see they did a very good job. That's the area as it stands now. The roof structure has been restored to the original design of the station. And although it's not very visible behind the serving counter, the original carved wood that formed the booking office windows has been retained. Outside, you lead straight onto the platforms to catch your train. An excellent example of heritage being put to a, a new use. One of the uh, most grandiose, of course, is the Gare de Lyon in Paris, where they have a fabulous restaurant called the Blue Train, which has been maintained in the condition it was built in the station. 
and it serves both passengers but mostly tourists. But it's a wonderful place to visit. You can see it's been decorated lavishly in the uh, end of uh, end of century style. It's naturally enough, it's classified as a historic monument by the French government. It's a nice place to dine. The big windows on one side look out onto the square opposite the station and on the other side, they look into the concourse and the arrival platforms for the trains. Uh, I think it's probably the most lavish restaurant in a station in the world. <sighs> Returning to my home town in Sydney, this is an old painting of Sydney Railway Station. It's the building with the clock tower on the right-hand side. It's had a refreshment room of, in various places since it was opened. Uh, this is the main concourse of Sydney Railway Station and the refreshment rooms are to the immediate right of the picture. Uh, it's a present day photograph. I think it was taken in at the Christmas season just before the pandemic uh, hit everybody. Over the years, the stations had a number of refreshment rooms. Uh, in the 1920s, they had a, a more upmarket restaurant on the first floor of the station, which did quite well, but was not as convenient as having something out on the main concourse. And in fact, this restaurant closed in about 1948. Uh, here's a picture of the food service area in one of the uh, later restaurants that was adjacent to the concourse. They had quite an extensive range of food with kitchens behind and the, the ladies there in their uniforms all served the customers uh, when they arrived to take a meal at the table. This, this also shows a refreshment room in Australia. It's at the uh, town of Dubbo in the country of New South Wales. And this photo is unusual because uh, the refreshment room at that time was being uh, re redecorated and repainted and was not being used. So the railways parked a dining car in the siding behind the station and that served as a refreshment room for a month while it was being repaired. Uh, that's the interior and uh, it wasn't perhaps a great alternative. It was a bit cramped, but it was certainly better than having no refreshments at all available. So dining cars don't have to be on the move when you eat in them. And lastly, another, well, lastly on this subject, it's another photo of a refreshment room in uh, New South Wales. It's in the town of Casino. And of course, you may notice it looks very like the photo of the Fred Harvey refreshment room back in America. You know, tables set up for six people, the waitresses standing around, uh, timber panelled rooms. So very much the same sort of approach uh, there. Uh, sadly, of course, this one has closed. Now, moving to something uh, a little more interesting. This picture says that it shows the refreshment room of uh, Mumbai CST, Victoria Terminus, as it was then, in the 1930s. It's taken from one of, one of Mr. Bandari's books, and it's certainly a large refreshment room in an Indian station, but I am unsure that it's whether it's in Mumbai CST. If you look at the columns and the roof structure, it doesn't look like anything in Mumbai, uh, in, in CST, and this next picture of where the station, the refreshment room used to be in the CST is totally different. Uh, it must have been a very nice refreshment room when this was operating, but it's a bit of a mystery, I think, as to where the previous picture was. So perhaps that's one the society could do a bit of research into and find the answer. Before we finish with refreshment rooms themselves, it's worth remembering that while they were operated by the railways instead of contractors, the railways normally had their own uh, badged cups, saucers, plates, knives and forks to show their ownership. And these examples are from the New South Wales Railway. There's a very nice wine glass, which in fact is made in Belgium. And in the background is a silver wine bucket to put the ice in. Uh, similarly, Indian Railways for many years used badged uh, cutlery and crockery. Uh, this picture, which was taken, I think, at Pathancott Railway Refreshment Room, shows a nice little milk jug with the Indian Railways crest on it, which is quite attractive. I think these have all disappeared a long while ago, unfortunately. But the Indian Railways logo continues to be used, and this one, of course, shows it on the ubiquitous paper cup in which the tea comes. But the other one is quite a nice little uh, bit of history. It's a milk jug badged by the Bombay, Baroda and Central India Railway, uh, which became the Central Railway, of course. And that's a rather nice little memento of uh, railways in years past. 
Well, that's pretty much the summary of the fixed infrastructure, the railway refreshment rooms. So it's time to take a look at dining cars, food on the move. The picture I've got here is a, a wagonly dining car in, in Europe. It's a combined kitchen dining car. The food was prepared and then served to the diners at the tables. This one is used on the preserved Venice Simple and Orient Express. And it's shown here in that train at Venice Station. Um, I'm afraid the ticket on the Orient Express is just a little bit outside my range, so I haven't traveled on this. This is a rather older one and quite historic. It's a refreshment and lounge car that was built by the Pullman Car Company in uh, 1898. And it was built specifically for the directors of the De Beers Diamond Mining Company in South Africa. It's preserved at Kimberley Station in South Africa. And although the outside of the carriage looks like it needs a little bit of work, uh, you know, a, a new coat of paint or varnish, it is in fact very well preserved. And indeed, the directors of the De Beers Mining Company certainly travelled and dined very well. This is the dining area as shown in the preserved carriage. Uh, very attractive. And the kitchen area, of course, had what was common in those days, a, a fuel stove, which was fueled either by coal or wood. Uh, and since it was a timber bodied carriage, you had to be reasonably careful that you didn't uh, set the carriage on fire in the course of preparing the food. And of course they didn't. This is what I call a, a picture of a, a typical refreshment car, dining car of the 1920s. It's on the New South Wales railways, uh, dating from the 20s, but you could have found a similar dining car anywhere around the world at that stage. It's got timber panelling, pressed metal ceilings, uh, separate chairs and tables, flowers, pretty much universal. But in fact, in New South Wales, they had very few dining cars and uh, the use of refreshment rooms and refreshment stops lasted on until the 1950s here, much later than it had in other, other countries. Here's a similar dining car on the Trans-Canada Express in 1924. Uh, it's quite an attractive picture, but I'll explain that the, um, the waiter is serving some water. What the lady with the hat on is doing is she's writing out her order on the waiter's order form because this was common practice in North America. The, in a restaurant, normally the waiter would take your order, make a note of it, and then bring you your food. But for some reason, well, the reason was to avoid mistakes. But for that reason, it was normal to ask the passenger to write their own order out on the uh, bill, which the waiter would then deal with. Um, personally, I've always preferred it when, you know, I've assumed that waiters know their job and will get the order correct. But on the railways, they were a little bit more cautious. I'm back in Australia now, and this was one of Australia's uh, best known trains in the 1930s and 40s. The train was entitled the Spirit of Progress. What a wonderful name. But it was one of the very early air conditioned trains, although it was steam hauled until about 1954 by some rather nice locomotives. But it was fully air conditioned and quite modern at the time. And of course, it had a refreshment dining car as well. A black and white photograph doesn't really do it justice, but the decoration in those days was um, simpler than the old fashioned ones. So it had plain wood paneling on the surrounds and you know, nice carpeting, good air, good air conditioning and very good soundproofing. So you've got a very comfortable ride, but it, it, uh, it looks a little bit ordinary when you first look at it. Uh, this is simply a publicity photograph from the railways showing a dining car on the Sydney to Melbourne Express. It's uh, naturally enough been staged with uh, professional models. Um, I wish all passengers looked as well presented as that. <laughs> However, it was a nice train and uh, clearly everybody's enjoying their lunch or dinner. Another solution that was tried in dining cars was the use of a buffet counter. And this, although this was tried in many countries, it was never as popular as a dining car with tables and chairs. It had the advantage that more people could be served a meal in a short, you know, in a fixed time because most people had their meal and left. They didn't sort of linger over the meal. It was less attractive to passengers, although you could get a good meal, but sitting sort of side by side, looking across the counter at the service area was not nearly as nice as sitting at a table where you could watch the country go by and talk to your fellow passengers. However, it was worth a try. And of course, uh, in America, 
passenger numbers started to drop off very greatly in the 1940s, what with the, uh, the widespread of airline services, the increasing uh, availability of motor cars, the passengers were walking away from railway services fast in the 1940s, but the American railways tried hard to retain them. and They really gave it their best shot. The example here is a train called the City of Los Angeles that was run by the Union Pacific Railroad. And they had a dining car that was placed in the dome of one of their dome observation carriages. Normally these carriages simply had passenger seats so you could travel up there and enjoy a good view of the scenery. But to make it more attractive, the Union Pacific fitted one out as a dining car. A good example of sort of innovation, and it was very popular, but as always, uh, nothing was going to stop the decline in passenger numbers, unfortunately, but they certainly tried some original ideas. In Britain, different ideas were tried as well. Uh, there were several carriages like this that ran on the southern region of British Railways in the 1950s, I think. Uh, they were a restaurant car that was styled as a tavern car to the extent that the outside of it was painted up like bricks and mortar and uh, wood and plaster to look like an old English uh, tavern or pub. And the inside was similarly fitted out. It, it doesn't look like a railway carriage at all. It looks like a very small English pub. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't find a lot of support from passengers, uh, probably because the windows were fairly small and you didn't have any view outside. And the seating was a little cramped and you had to sit sort of facing people across the carriage. And bear in mind, British carriages were somewhat smaller than many others. So it was another good idea and it certainly was original, but it didn't catch on. This will be a little bit more familiar to many of uh, the viewers. An Indian Railways pantry car. I think the photo is taken at Nizamuddin Station, but this one's in rather nice condition. There's many of these and a great many tasty meals are prepared here and served through the train. Um, I should apologize that the interior photo I've got probably is not a really good one. The carriage looks as if it needs a bit of a, a, a makeover, but there's uh, you know, samosas ready for preparation there. There's plenty of food being prepared. And you can see at the end of the carriage, the serving area where the uh, catering staff will take the food through to the passengers uh, at their seats. And here indeed are the catering crew, all ready to serve out the food and uh, looking to jump to it. Um, they generally provide a pretty good service in my experience too. In the background, you can see the fold hang above the windows in the corridor are the fold down bunks that the crew have as uh, sleeping accommodation overnight. It, it's quite a hard, hard job they have, but they do it well. Uh, Warren, you have five minutes more. Thank you, I shall keep to the schedule. <laughs> this is the Darjeeling Railway, uh, also has a dining facility. The railway never had dining cars in its heyday, and indeed it didn't run services at night. But about 15 years ago, they had the good idea of building a small dining car, which is shown here. It seats 12 people, and with two sittings for dinner, you can seat feed 24, which is a good size for a tour group. The catering is done by one of the local hotels at Siliguri. Uh, they don't have the facilities to cook the food on the train. But it was a, a very good venture, and it's been, I think, quite successful. And hopefully when the pandemic is passed and travel resumes, this will continue its uh, success. In France, the heritage railway trips often include a dining car, not as an automatic part, it's something you can book as an extra to, on your journey. This is a steam railway excursion out of Paris with a couple of wagon lee carriage. And the second one, the blue one, is a dining car in its original condition. Uh, you can book a meal on the train on the way back and it'll be served in a very similar fashion to the way it would have been back in the days of the, the wagon, the operations. The, uh, the carriage is pretty much in its 1940s style. And my wife is enjoying her dinner, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> the blue train in South Africa is a more, much more recent one. It's still op operated by the, tr the transport rail operator. It's not a, a train developed by the tourist industry as such but it has quite a nice dining car that was uh, rebuilt in the 1990s and continues to be operational on, you know, when the, when the train is running and like a lot of things, it isn't running at the moment. Very attractively fitted out inside. <laughs> the 
The food preparation shown here is actually in a British Railways carriage. I believe it's the Flying Scotsman. Uh, you can see the food service area is on the right and the waiters are waiting there to take the trays of food to the diners where they will serve out individual portions at the seats. This is a photo of a setting on the Flying Scotsman in the 1920s, taken for publicity purposes. And uh, if you look very carefully, you can see that they've actually got a bottle of one of the most expensive champagnes you can buy on the table. So I don't think it was everyday service, but very nice with the fresh flowers and everything else. On the other hand, uh, some dining cars are not that attractive. There were two McDonald's carriages uh, running in Switzerland for many years, and the Swiss railways were smart enough to indicate in the timetable which ones were McDonald's carriages and which ones were real dining cars, so you had a choice. In uh, Hungary, they've got some current tour trains, one called the Majestic Imperata. It uses modern rolling stock that's been painted up to uh, represent dining back in the days of the, the royal family. It's got no particular historic significance, but it recreates the style of travel that uh, royal, the royal Hungarian family might have had at the beginning of the 20th century, very beginning. It's all set up very nicely with you know, plenty of curtains and gold leaf, a nice day out, but it's only used for half day trips. Uh, we're looking at a Hungarian dining car. Yes. Most of the passengers there have either got grey hair or very little hair, so you can tell that it's a, a tour group with retired people, but it's a, a very attractive uh, example of modern dining car construction. Something a bit more basic, uh, a Polish railway dining car, and I quite like this because it's, it's clean, it's bright and cheerful. You can get simple meals to eat at the tables there, and there's a catering trolley to go through the train with uh, small meals. The French TGV, this is a dining, uh, I won't say a dining section, it's the food section on one of the two deck TGVs on the upper deck. Generally, you can buy a very limited range of pre-prepared meals there to take back to your seat or eat them at the benches just sitting on the stools there. Here's much the same thing on a single deck TGV. Um, it's, it's certainly fast food in every name and it's better than having none. I like this one. It's a Swiss railway dining car taken about 30 years ago, <coughs> very attractively fitted out with a range of tables. There will seat a group of five or six at the round ones and tables for just two people along the side. But the lighting and decor is quite attractive. A Vietnamese railway carriage. Uh, the food is cooked and served there. Another view of a Vietnamese carriage, but with some of the lights not working, it looks rather sort of bleak with only the neon lights on the top. And one of my favorites, it's a South African railway carriage in 1923. It's a type C22 dining car with carved timber columns, clerestory roof, uh, wonderful hats. And the nice thing is you can still travel in these. Quite a few have been restored and retained and they are used on tourist trains, which make for a really great experience. Uh, if you're dining in one of these, you might well be dining you know, 40 years ago. In fact, they remained in regular service until the mid-1970s. A quick look at platform dining. Most of the terminal stations in Europe have got a dining outlet on the elevated levels where you can overlook the platforms. A great place to dine, you can have your food and enjoy, enjoy the trains at the same time. At the Gare du Nord in Paris, they had a similar arrangement. Unfortunately, it's been lost now to make Warren, you got muted. Can you unmute yourself? Am I here? Can you I be heard be, now? You should be finishing now. Yes, okay. Well, I shall move through to the... Ah, this is a neat... We're nearly finished. Nice station where they have a dining area out on the platform, mainly so that smokers can dine outside, but you also can enjoy the trains going past or a beer while the TGV passes you. I'll go through these ones fairly quickly. This is the Railway Museum at a town called um, Villanova y la Geltru in Spain, where again, food is available on the platform. 
You can even get it on the Berlin Metro. They have a bistro actually on the Metro platforms, mostly for takeaway. Sydney Station, where there are some dining facilities out on the concourse, although that's disappeared with COVID. And we finish up by saying goodbye to these two ladies who are taking the food trolley around on Central Railway Station. So I'll stop here and go back to any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Warren. You took us around the world to platform dining, to din dining cars, as well as uh, restaurants at railway stations. Uh, we have one question from Mayank Tiwari, who is asking, uh, he says, Mr. Miller, have you traveled on Russian? Uh, no. So, which one are your three favorite dining cars and why? Oh, uh, should I answer uh, with, with microphone or in the chat group? Uh, should I answer on the microphone or the chat? No, you answer microphone, of course. Ah, right. Uh, I think the, the vintage South African dining car is classic because it's it was a beautiful design to start with and it lasted for many, many years and they had a lot of them in South Africa. But that's a heritage carriage, so you can't really travel on it nowadays. African Blue Train is very nice. It's modern technology. But for the third one, I think I'd uh, recommend some of the Hungarian railways. They, the Hungarian railways operate a very substantial heritage rail, heritage um, tour, uh, yeah, uh, heritage area, but it's operated by the mainstream railway and they do it very professionally. So when they run a heritage uh, charter train or one on their own accounts that anyone can book, they usually have a, a good quality dining car, which uh, is comfortable, provides good food, and that's really the, the test of a good dining car. Uh, Dipesh from Russia is asking, Mr. Miller, have you traveled on Russian trains? If yes, how was your experience? I regret to say that's a simple answer. No, I haven't. But <laughs> and at my age, I'm not sure I ever will get the chance, but I'd certainly like to. Uh, there have been a number of comments. Arun Bagra, uh, he writes that the dining car named Tenzing Norge of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway was built at the Dharia workshop in 2001 at the initiative of the then general manager of the Northeast Frontier Railway Zone of India, Sri Bist. Uh, Mr. Bagra was then the divisional railway manager at, uh, uh, what's the name of the place? Katiar. Yes. Yes, I think so Mr. Bisht is a member of this is society. A recent, this is a fairly recent dining car. Yes, By I was wrong when I said it was 15 cars, years. See, about 40 years back, a number of trains in India had dining cars. But today, up, except for the luxury trains and the uh, Deccan Queen, no other train has a dining car. Hmm. That's a pity, but given the number of people who need to be fed, I can understand how it's happened. Hmm. But all, all congratulations to the Darjeeling Railway because their Tenzing Norge dining car is a very nice little operation. Incidentally, Tenzing Norge was the person who accompanied Edmund Hillary as the first man on Mount Everest in 1953, I, I think it was. I think I might say that Edmund Hillary was the man who accompanied Tenzing Norge, but I won't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aparna Garg uh, comments, the Golden Chariot uh, in Karnataka is expected to resume services soon. It got postponed during the pandemic. Oh, that would be very good. Uh, Dipinder Kapani gives an interesting comment. He says, till the 60s, in most of the small towns in India, the best restaurant was the railway restaurant. I'm sure that's true. Hmm. I th I've His heard grandfather, he says... His grandfather used to say that in pre-independence railway restaurant rooms, the best food in town was at the railway restaurant. Yes, yeah, well, that, that's a good measure and it was, it's nice to have that reliability. Uh, Bill writes, Dear Warren, I will send you pictures of the dining area of our new Caledonian sleeper carriages in Scotland. Hope you might find a chance to use one before too long. This is I'm Bill sure Reed. I will. Yeah. Of course, I look there, are a lot of, there are a lot of other comments, all of them complimentary. I'm and thanking you for a good tour of the dining systems the world over. 
Oh, thank you, Jail. I, I have one comment. Seeing the steam days, trains were slower. They stopped frequently because of you know watering and changing locomotives and so on. Today, with diesels and electrics and high speed, I think the fun of dining on a train has gone. Would you agree with me? I think generally it has, but you know, for, to, for an enthusiast, if you look look for something to enjoy, usually you can find something. Another interesting comment you might have found in India. In India, there are a number of railway stations which are identified with a specific food item they serve. All right. Is that true? In, is that true in the rest of the world also? Ooh, I think I think well, probably not. I think most of the railway res restaurants now tend to aim for the middle of the road and go for meals that will suit a lot of people. But yes, I think in years past, they had more local specialties. Mm. See, I'm not talking only of uh, the restaurants at the station. I'm talking of platform vending. See, on the, rail, ah. on the platform itself, we had vendors. Like I yes. remember on, on the Western Railway Zone, there was a station called Sendra, where they served you what were called dahi balas. I mean, if you traveled on the train, you waited for that station. And since it was a watering station, you had a sufficiently long halt mm. to order something or no, buy something on the platform itself and have it. Yes. I don't think this is there and elsewhere in the world. Yep. Yes. No, very good. <laughs> Similarly, I could name at least 20 stations offhand in India where a specific food item is served. Of course, item may be served elsewhere well, also, but that station became uh, famous for it. Indeed, yes. Like because uh, somebody writes Madhur Vada at Bangalore Division, hot milk at Khurja Station. I mean, as I said, I could name about 20 stations with that specific food item that was served there. Yes. Again, somebody says Poha at Ujjain Station. Harshvardhan writes, dining cars came about with long distance trains that didn't stop very often. Mm, nice. Yes, true. Vikas Singh writes, sadly, the restaurant where Madhur Vada was first made closed down a few years back. Ah, oh dear. Ah, oh dear. Yes. Actually, with trains speeding up, anything served at a restaurant doesn't really help. Not really, no. Um, it's more a case of at the beginning or the end of the journey. Hmm. I remember in the, in the 60s, when I was traveling uh, on the Delhi-Jamalpur uh, route, you could actually at Patna station, while the train was had a halt there, you got out of the station, went to the restaurant, had a meal and came back. I mean, yes. You had a halt of that kind. I think today such halts just don't exist. Yes, yes. I like, see somebody recommended Orange Barfi. I think I'd like to go there, yes. please. <laughs> this is at Nagpur station. Yes. Anyway, Mr. Miller, thank you very, very much. It was the most entertaining and uh, enlightening uh, talk. Mm, I hope I've we have many it. more from you in the future. Well, I look forward to the remaining speakers. Hmm. Uh, I would like to mention that Warren has been a very regular contributor to our magazine. Uh, to the best, from what I recall, he has contributed at least four articles on varied subjects. One was on old railway timetables. One was on cigarette cards. One was on a journey he made on the Delhi Ring Railway, something people in Delhi don't do, but he made a trip right around the Ring Railway. Uh, and there was another one, I think, on uh, film, Indian films. Ah, yes. Hmm. So he's a regular contributor and we look forward to far more articles from him. Hmm. A number of uh, 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 comments are now coming in. Uh, I can read some of them. There's egg masala and Malabar paratha at Palghat Junction. Somebody's asking which is the food famous at Howrah Station. I don't really know. Okay, okay, Warren, thank you very much. We'll come to the end of your talk. Sure. Thank Once you. Once upon a time, Howrah had a, a Chinese room run by the Great Eastern Hotel in Calcutta. And that okay. ran for uh, two decades. That was very much of a favorite. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you all. I would like to hand over to Mayank Tiwari so that he can introduce the next talk.